Hey guys, thank you so much for clicking on this video. We hope that this message can strengthen your faith and encourages you in your walk with God today. We would love to stay connected with you guys, so make sure you subscribe to this channel and check out our Instagram and our Facebook as well. That's all we have for you guys today, so let's get into the message. You know, I might not look like much of a dancer to you. In fact, my kids would highly encourage me to never dance, in public at least. <laughs> But when I was younger, probably first through sixth grade, I took tap, ballet, and jazz for a little bit. And during one of my classes of tap, we were preparing for a recital, and we had these wicker fans. We were dancing to Too Darn Hot by Ella Fitzgerald, and we were doing this little tap dance. And so we're preparing for this recital, which is weeks away, and during the re rehearsal, I poked myself in the eye with the fan because I'm just so graceful like that. And as I poked myself in the eye, I could hear, thun you know, you hear the thunder in your head when you get something in your eye and my tears are coming down my face. Well, I stopped dancing and I had a very dramatic teacher, very dramatic. And so I'm going to be Miss Sherry for a second and just show you what she, what she did. Class. Sit, 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 sit. Record player stops. That's how old I am. That was a record player. Record player stops. Sit, 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 sit. Everyone sit. Listen, let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, there was a ballet dancer, and she was putting on a beautiful performance. And as she began to leap across the stage, it was a rusty, rickety, old wooden stage. It was a rusty nail sticking up out of that stage. And as she leapt across the stage, her foot hit the nail and her foot began to bleed. And do you know what she did? She kept dancing. She didn't stop dancing. She didn't stop. She continued to dance. She continued to put on a performance. Never stop dancing. And do you know how I know about that story? Because I was that ballerina. <laughs> so dramatic, right? I'm like, okay, lady, I'm 10 years old. It's weeks away from the recital. I get the picture. My whole class is staring at me like, hey, you made this happen. You made us have to listen to this sermon. But you know, a lot of things happen behind the scenes that we don't know about, right? Movies and plays, they imitate life. You've heard the quote, art imitates life. And a lot of times, what goes on behind the scenes has the biggest impact on what we see on the screen. So many things that we don't know about that happen in movies and plays, like think about the last-minute casting changes that cause the play to take off or the movie to take off, or the last-minute script change that changes the plot of the movie, or it's the line that everybody says from the movie forever and ever, and they just, like, changed it at the last minute, or the producer that steps in, or the, the last-minute funding that comes in for the project, the hardships that they face, the dragging on, the weather that affects them, the production issues, the machinery that breaks down, the travel that's involved, the things that happen in the, the cast life behind the scenes, it affects everything. And just like in the movies, in real life, we all have a story. We all have things that are happening behind the scenes in our life. We have joy. We have pain. We have all kinds of things that are happening. And lots of times, those things that are happening behind the scenes affect everything else. And it's Really, people see our lives, and sometimes they think, they see the highlight reel, right? They don't know about all the, jo the pain that we've experienced or the joys that we've experienced. They don't see how it all fits together. Sometimes they, people want other people's lives, but they don't know what it took to get where they are, right? We don't know what goes on behind the scenes. But we know in life that God is the author and the finisher of our faith. In him, we have a writer. We have a producer. We have everything in him. And he is working behind the scenes of our lives. 
But I think it's crazy, as we're talking about this behind-the-scenes series, it just hit me. I think it's a little bit crazy that sometimes we talk about God working behind the scenes of our lives as if we are the main character. But God is the main character. Now, don't get me wrong. Like, he does care about what's going on in our life. He cares about all the things that concern us. In fact, there's a lot of scripture that tells us that. Isaiah 45, 15 says, clearly, you are a God who works behind the scenes. God of Israel, save your God. John 5, 17, but Jesus replied, my father is always working and so am I. John 13, 7, Jesus replied, you don't realize now what I'm doing, but one day you will understand. He does care about what's going on behind the scenes of our lives, but I think we get it wrong when we start thinking we're the main event. We're the main character. It's all about us because God is the main one. The earth is his stage. Matter of fact, the Bible says the earth is his footstool and heaven is his throne. He sees it all. He's the main event. He's the alpha. He's the omega. He's the beginning. He's the end. He's the author. He's the finisher. And he's given us the script, the holy scriptures. He's given us the literal script from beginning to end. He tells us at the beginning how it got, how it got started. It's filled with prophecies, thousands of which have already come true and more to be fulfilled. And then there's like a middle section. We've got the history books. We've got the poetry books. We've got the epistles. We've got the law. We've got everything we need in this book. But in the middle, he's telling us, okay, as a kingdom person, you can't just be acting like everybody else because you're not from this world. This world is not your home. You're passing through. And as a kingdom person, this is how you need to think about things. And this is how you behave as a kingdom person. This is how you talk as a kingdom person. This is how you live as a kingdom person. And then there's an end. There's an end to the book. And I think sometimes we forget there's an end to the book. There's an end coming. Jesus is the finale. He's going to split the eastern sky, and he's going to come back, and he's going to receive his church, his bride, and we're going to live with him forever in eternity. That's happening. And it's probably coming a lot sooner than we think. I don't know if you've watched the news lately, but it's like every day, what page of Revelation are we in? What's happening today? Jesus is coming back. Hebrews 12, 2, he's the author and the finisher of our faith. But I think we get caught up in thinking it's all about us. Or as Christians, we can get distracted and off course and off mission completely off mission. We think we got plenty of time to get it right. We're in the middle. There's plenty of time to fix all that stuff. And we could just go on about our life as if there's not a greater mission at hand, that there will be a finish. As Israel is now under attack, it's really fulfilling some prophetic words. I believe it's sooner than we think that Jesus is going to return. We cannot allow ourselves to be distracted. And we cannot allow ourselves to think that we are the main character and that this world is our prize. This is not all there is. There's so much more. But just like in the movies, there's distractions, right? Have you ever been to the movies and there's like a lot of distractions? We took our staff, you know the loud talkers, people that are on their phones, having a whole conversation on their phones, We took our staff a couple of months ago to see a movie that was really not appropriate for kids, but some people brought their kids in there, toddlers, babies, and they're like screaming and crying and crawling all all over the floor, running up and down the stairs. And you know when there's a distraction, what happens? You miss the movie. You miss really important parts. You miss lines. You might miss the plot twist, and you might even miss the finale if there's a distraction. And sometimes we are so distracted in life. We're so distracted. We're pulled apart. That's what it means to distract, to be pulled apart. We're pulled in so many different directions. And in Mark chapter 4, Jesus talks about a distracted heart. He tells a parable about four types of soil. 
And his word is the seed. And the soils are the different types of hearts. There's the rocky soil, there's the shallow soil, there's the thorn, the soil with the thorns in it, and then there's the good soil, that when you hear the word, it's planted, and it produces a beautiful harvest. And that's the kind of heart we all want. We want that kind of soil, but that thorn soil is the distracted heart. And Jesus said about that distracted heart, this is what it is. This is what the thorns are. It's the worries of life, the lure for wealth, and the desire for other things. And if we're distracted by the worries of this life and the riches of this world and thinking this is all there is and we're just caught up in the middle of the story and we forget there's an end, we're going to not be fruitful. That's what he said happens. The thorn chokes out the fruit and we can't even produce fruit. And God cares about the fruit that we produce. He cares deeply. And we won't produce fruit if we are distracted. And under this banner of worries of life, there's a lot of things we can worry about. But one of the things that I think I see most often in people is unhealed pain that cause worry after worry and cause collateral damage for so many people that weren't even involved in the pain in the first place. Unhealed pain. And as I was preparing for this message, I feel like the Holy Spirit just dropped a phrase into my heart. And I had to go look it up because I'm like, I don't remember what that story's about. The phrase was, the Trojan horse the enemy hides inside of is unhealed pain. And unhealed pain. What's a Trojan horse? In Greek mythology, there's a story about the Greeks and they were fighting Troy and the Greeks built this big wooden horse and they hid inside of it. And they act, the rest of them acted like they were leaving the island and they, they go off and then Troy thinks, well, we're going to take that wooden horse as our trophy and they pull it over to their spot. And when they pull it over, the army jumps out, they open the gates and they're defeated. And that's what the enemy does. Whenever there's pain in our life, I always look in church and people's lives and I think, whenever someone gets hurt, whenever someone gets offended, whenever someone gets any kind of pain, doesn't matter what it is, the enemy is right around the corner. He's like, how can I use this? How can I use this to divide people? How can I use this to conquer people? How can I use this to cause offense and divide the people of God, divide families, divide marriages, divide kids. The enemy uses pain. It's a weapon. He hides inside of that pain. Think about this on a global scale. Like think about even just what's happening right now in Israel. An event happens. Everybody, it's blasted all over the news. And then what happens? Everybody weighs in with their opinions and their judgments. Maybe they don't even have all the facts, but they're going to say what they think, and then it's going to cause division, and that's exactly what the enemy wants. Take it down to your personal life, your personal family. Whenever there's pain and we don't get healed from that pain, it causes division. It causes offense. It causes people to break apart the things that God meant for us to keep together, and we get off mission. We're not even thinking about winning people to Jesus because we think we're in the middle of the story. We got plenty of time. It's all about us, and we're looking for what everybody else can do for us and what they should have done, what they could have done, and we make it all about us. The enemy hides inside of that unhealed pain. And sometimes we can get in pain and be really committed, really committed to being right making our case, and we're more committed to doing that than we are to doing what is right according to the script. There's a script tells us what to do. We go rogue. We go improv. We just improvise, and we're just going by our feelings. Well, this is what I think I should do. Instead of asking the Holy Spirit, instead of asking God what he says about it, Okay, so what do I do when I'm in pain? What do I do when someone hurts me? What, what do I do when someone rejects me? 
What do I do? Well, according to Jesus, do I put it on Facebook? Do I try to get a whole bunch of people on my side? So I look like the good girl and they look like the bad people? Do I try to get an army on my side and play the victim? Or do I go to that person and go, hey, listen, when you said this to me, or when you did this to me, this is how it made me feel. And it didn't feel good. And I want us to have a good relationship. I want to move forward in my life. Can we work this out? And if you can't change that behavior, we're not going to be able to walk together. Like, that's got to change. That hurt. We got to figure out a way to move forward. That's what the script says we're supposed to do. Also, the script has, there's a lot of, a lot of scriptures in here about staying out of other people's business. <laughs> Stay out of their business. If you're not part of the problem, if you're not part of the solution, Stay out. You don't have to. There's so many things we don't even have to have an opinion about. We don't have to have a judgment about. We don't have to know everything that's going on all over the whole wide world. This is what we need to know. God's tell, told us everything we need to know right here. I, we tell our kids this because I see this happen in marriages, and so we're, we're prepared for this ahead of time. In marriages, you'll see, like, one party or the other, the husband or the wife, goes to their parents when they're upset with their spouse. And they're like, they did this and they did that. And then they, the couple, they work it out and they're fine. They just go, go on along their way. And then the mom, the parents are stuck with these feelings. So if the daughter goes to her parents, they're mad at the husband and they're stuck with those feelings because the couple works it out. So we've, we've already told our kids, hey guys, when y'all get married, don't come to us with complaining about your spouse. This is what we're going to do. If both of you agree that you both want to come and talk to us about it, and you both want our opinion, you want our input, you want our advice, that's fine. But we're not going to put, we're not playing that game. We're not pitting people against each other. Because the enemy wants to divide. This, this, the pain of offense, the pain of rejection, the pain of division. And we can't get healed so many times because we expect other people to take responsibility for our pain. Let me say that again. We don't get healed sometimes because we expect other people to take responsibility for our pain. It's nobody else's responsibility. It's ours. God wants to heal it. He does. He cares. And how you know if you're not healed is because you keep talking about it. It's coming out of your mouth, out of the overflow of your heart. Your mouth speaks, so you're just talking about it, talking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it, and it keeps you from moving forward in life. You jump from relationship to relationship to relationship, from job to job to job, from church to church to church, because it's them. Oh, it's them. John Maxwell has a saying, says, if Bob has a problem with everybody, guess who's the problem? Bob. If your name is Bob and you're here today, we love you. <laughs> do we think it's them. If they would do this, then I wouldn't do this. If they wouldn't do this, then I wouldn't act like this. It's their fault. Instead of taking responsibility for our own hearts. And then there's sometimes in our story things that go on behind the scenes that are keeping us stuck. And I think, there's a, I think there's a rightful pause sometimes in our life. And it's a time where we need to grieve some things. There's a time where we need to stop and pause and grieve some things that have been lost in our life. I think about in my own life, there were some times where I was in so much pain, I could not even think about tomorrow. I had a broken engagement to a person who I thought was the greatest thing ever. We had the most healthy, godly relationship I'd ever had. And I had painted my whole life ahead after this engagement. And I thought it was my future. 
And when he walked out of my life, I felt like it was a God, I felt like God did it, that God was rejecting me, and it almost took me out. I was ready to end my life. I couldn't see past the day. I think about some ladies in our church who just recently, their spouse went to be with Jesus, and they're widows today. I think about Miss Jennifer and Miss Gladys and Miss Beverly, and how badly they're hurting right now. Matter of fact, if you know them, why don't you just pray for them? Just say their name out loud to Jesus and say, God, be with them. If you know them, maybe send them a card, send them a text today. Say, hey, I'm thinking about you. God sees you. He hasn't forgotten you. Sometimes we're in so much pain that we can't even think about tomorrow. We're grieving. And I remember my pastor said something to me. He called me when I was going through that time, and I was ready to end my life. And he said, Sharla, listen, your life is like this big, big picture. There's God's big picture. It's way bigger than your life. There's a big picture being drawn. And he said, it's like a masterpiece, and it's almost like little puzzle pieces. And you can, he'll give you a few puzzle pieces, and sometimes you get a few more, and you can see a little bit into the future. But sometimes when you're in pain, all you can see is the one you're holding. You can't even look to the future. You don't want to see the rest of the masterpiece because you think your life is over and you're focused on that one piece. And he said, I just want to remind you, it's not over. There is more for you. If you're in pain today, God wants to beat you in your pain. He wants you to grieve that pain. He's got hope for your future. There's still hope. It's not over. Don't give up. I think about, yes. It's not over. If I had given up, if I had ended my life when I thought my life was over, all that I would have missed, I would have missed being married to the most wonderful man in the world, having an incredible marriage, having three of the most amazing kids and the most incredible church and those incredible friendships. And experiences, I would have missed so much if I had given up. So don't give up. Your story is not over. But sometimes we can get stuck. And just like that story I told you about the tap dancing, I think when things happen in our life that are painful, the enemy swoops in and he tries to tell us some lies. And I think for me in that story, one of the things I heard when Miss Sherry said, you keep dancing. Don't matter what you feel, you keep moving, you keep performing, no matter what the pain is, you just keep on putting on your performance, and you shove it down. But that's not, that's not it, that's not the way to heal, shove it down. Some of us need to go see a counselor, some of us need to get into a small group, some of us need to share our pain, because what happens is you store pain. It stores up in your life, and it will come out in other ways. There's a book called The Body Keeps the Score. Your body's keeping score. And those unhealed emotions are coming out in all kinds of ways. People that are in addiction, they didn't decide they just wanted to blow up their life one day. People that are cutting themselves didn't decide, hey, I just really like to hurt myself. People that are dealing with serious issues, they didn't decide that they wanted to do that. They're in pain. And they're trying to grab at what will bring them comfort. And then, when we're in pain, sometimes we know we're supposed to take it to God. Or we need to read the Word, or we need to pray, or we need to worship, or we need to go do this, that, or the other. But instead, we reach for the bag, or the bottle, or the pill, or the person, or the relationship. The title, the money, the pursuit, the busyness. We reach for all these things, and then we feel guilty and ashamed because we're like, oh, I know I shouldn't have done that. I should have, I should have reached out to you, God. And we start the shame cycle, and then we don't want to tell anybody because we think the enemy's got us believing you're the only one. You're just a mess up. Like, the reason this keeps happening is because of you. It's because you are faulty. You are messed up. And it's a lie. When you get in small group, what you find out is when you share what you're going through, people in your group are going to be like, me too. Me too. And guess what? This is how I got through it. And this is what the Word of God says. This is what the Lord told me. And I'm praying for you. And I'm lifting you up. Because we need each other. We need each other. 
We don't want to, the enemy wants us to interpret the things that are done to us as evidence that we're defective. And God loves you so much. He wants to heal all the broken places that are in you. And I think sometimes we forget, too, that the reason God hates sin, and this is why we, we condemn ourselves and we feel so ashamed, we forget the reason God hates sin is because it destroys his kids. It hurts his children. When you're in the middle of sin, it's not like God is looking at you and going, I hate her. I hate him. He's going, I hate that sin because look what it's doing to my kid. It's tearing him up. And it doesn't matter how far you've run or what you've done. He's still saying, come on. I got his forgiveness is, <laughs> there's no limit. His blood is greater. His sacrifice is greater than anything you've ever done. He wants to cover it. He wants to make you whole. He wants to bring healing into your life. He wants to heal your pain. So today, I really want to encourage you to pull the curtain on your pain and stop hiding it. Stop shoving it down. Just open it up to God and say, God, here I am. Here it is. And that may mean you need to walk through that with somebody. And your purpose is so important. You've got to find your purpose. That's why we want you to go to next steps, to get connected in church, because we want to help you discover what your purpose is. Because your purpose is way bigger than your pain, and when you discover what your purpose is, it actually helps you heal. It's part of the healing process. But we're in this big story. There was a beginning, there's a middle, and there's an end coming. There's a finale. And we'll be talking in the next couple of weeks more about what's happening in the world today and what, what this means about Israel and prophetic words that are coming to pass. But as we head towards the end of time, when Jesus does split the sky and come back and get his church, the urgency is there. We feel this sense of urgency. I went on a mission trip several years ago to Russia. I was there for 14 days, and we were doing street evangelism, and we would, do, uh, we would go to several orphanages, and we went to the largest baby house in Russia, 200 babies in this particular place. Got to minister to all kinds of people, but there was a sense of urgency, especially when we were in the street, because I thought every person that walks past me that I don't get to give this information to, every person that walks past me and I don't get to tell them about Jesus, they may go to hell without ever knowing God. And I am, I am trying to grab every person that I pass by because I might not ever come back here again. And sometimes when we're in America, we're lulled to sleep. We're just lulled to sleep by what's going on around us. We're pursuing the wealth and we're pursuing things. We're pursuing, well, we're actually pursuing worry sometimes because we're just worrying about the things all around us instead of actually getting in the game and being on mission for what God has for us. But the closer we get to the end, I hope that a sense of urgency will come on us. And Jesus as he gave us the Great Commission, this is what it says, just in case you need a reminder, this is what Jesus said that we're supposed to be doing. This is our mission. Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Everybody say, go. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and then lo, I'll be with you. I'll be with you the whole time. I'm going to be with you the whole time, and I'm going to be with you to the end of the age. Go. Get on mission. We've got to get on mission, but we can't be distracted. We can't think we've got plenty of time. We can't think we're in the middle of the story. We can't think, I'm just going to keep shoving my pain down and worrying and worrying and worrying and causing collateral damage everywhere I go. I need to take responsibility for my healing so that I can turn around and be someone that heals other people, so that I can be a person that God can use. It's not all about me. It's not all about us. It's all about Him. It's all about Jesus. You know, there's been a lot of 
junk that's gone on in my life behind the scenes. But when I sing about the faithfulness of God, every time I sing about the faithfulness of God, there's this picture that comes into my mind. And I don't know about you, when you think about the faithfulness of God and things that God's brought you through and the things that you've done and how he's shown up time and time again, maybe there's a picture that shows up in your mind. But for me, I think about that since I was a little girl, my parents took me to church. I'm so grateful. So grateful I had parents that put me in an environment where I could hear the word God. Sometimes I think we forget. You know, maybe we think we can, we can catch the word, but our kids, we need to be in an environment where they're seeing other people model out their faith. And they need to see people reading in the word. And I think about my parents, and I went to this church on Stewart Avenue in Atlanta, Georgia, two-story church, and I remember them holding me by my hand, in my little white frilly dress, and my little white really socks and my black patent leather shoes and my little ringlets and barrettes in my hair holding me by the hand, walking me up them big old stairs and taking me into a Sunday school room and me walking in and there was teachers there to teach me and there was furniture there for me to sit on because somebody gave and there was this little white plastic church and it had a steeple on it and it had a little slot and my parents would put money in my hand and I would walk in, I would put the money in the church, and they would say, you know what this is for? This is for missionaries, and they're going to tell people about Jesus all over the world, and you get to be a part of that. And I had this picture, God, you've always been faithful to me. Even when I didn't understand what I was really doing when I was giving, now when I look at my life and I look at all the hardships, I look at when I ran so far from God, I didn't think that he could even forgive me and I thought I was going to hell. I think about the people who have hurt me in my life and people that have been misjudged me or stabbed me in the back or think about the times when I didn't know what was going on with my kids and I thought we had done everything that we were supposed to do. And yet they were far from God, so far from God, and I didn't even see how it was possible for them to come back. But every time God's been faithful, every single time He has been faithful. And so I sing about the faithfulness of God, and I say, God, you got me. You've had me my whole life. Even when I was running, you had me, and you will have me for the rest of my life, and there's nothing I'm going to withhold from you. You can have it all. You're real. You're true. You're good. And every time I do what this book says, I get what this book says I'm going to have because God is faithful to his word. I want to ask you to stand. Maybe there's some of you here today who... You're dealing with some unhealed pain, and you know that there, you need to get healed. It's causing havoc. It's causing collateral damage in your life, and you want healing from that. I want to pray for you. I'm going to pray for two groups of people. That's the first group. I want to pray for people who are hurting. I want to pray specifically for you. So if you would bow your head, close your eyes. If, if you're in this room and you would say, I've got some unhealed pain, I want to pray for you, and I believe there's power in prayer. There's power in agreement. I want to come into agreement with you. Would you lift your hand? I'm just going to pray with you. I see hands everywhere. Okay, everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Yeah, we all got some pain. All right, you can put your hands down. Lord, I pray for every single person that lifted their hand here today with those unhealed traumas, those unhealed pains. Lord, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you would wrap your arms around them, Lord, that you would give them the comfort Holy Spirit, like only you can do, that you would minister to the deepest parts of them. God, that you would touch them. And God, we stand on your word. You said that after we've suffered a little while, you yourself would heal us, restore us, and set our feet on a solid rock. And so, God, I thank you that you're doing that in their life right now. And God, I thank you that by the stripes of Jesus, they are healed, they are made whole, they are made new. 
And Lord, if they need to talk to somebody and process their pain, I pray that you would direct them to the right small group, direct them to the right counselor, direct them to the right people, that you would remove the wrong people from their life and put the right people in their life to help them to move their life forward. Help them to make decisions, to take responsibility for their life and their pain. Minister your incredible love to them in Jesus' name. And with your head still bowed, your eyes still closed, if you're here today and you would say, you know what, I recognize the end of the story is here, it's coming. The end of the story is here and you would say, I'm ready to go all in with Jesus. I've never given him everything. I've never gone all in. There's no better time than today. So on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand if you would say, I'm giving it all to Jesus today. One, two, three. I see your hand. I see your hands. I see your hands. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, 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 yes. Praise God. Everybody, let's say this together, including all of you who raised your hand. We want to help you to continue your walk. So don't leave here today without hearing what your next step is. But right now, your step is to pray from, the, from your heart with all that you've got to pray this prayer. And everybody, I would love it if we would just all say it together. Father God. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for shedding your blood for me. I receive your forgiveness. I repent for doing life my own way. And from this day forward, I choose to live for you, following you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.